as if Americans didn't already have enough to worry about, all of us, about the growing toxicity of their food, our food, our water, our soil, our air, including, of course, aspartame, the genetic modification of crops, and the over 10,000 different chemical compounds uh, the average person can come into contact with every day, we must now deal with a dark and very real specter. In fact, we are dealing with it already, the specter of radiation and radioactivity in our food and our environment. Dr. Blaylock is one of the great physicians and healers of our times and first put us on notice that we must become proactive about what we eat and what we drink with his legendary book, Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. He has gone on from there to produce a downpour of life-saving information. Again, his latest article is posted on Newsmax.com and linked through the radiation feature box at Rents.com. This issue of radiation is something that perplexes many Americans because, tragically and unfortunately, the government is doing what the government does so very well. They're not doing their job. They're not telling us, they're not keeping us informed, advised, or up-to-date and educated about what this threat is and how serious we need to take it. All we can do is look at the stories I'm able to pull together and a few other good journalists, and they suggest that uh, there is radioactivity, they say too low, of course, to make a difference, in green leafy vegetables, uh, in milk, cesium in Vermont milk, most especially concerning iodine in California and Washington milk, so where are we, Dr. Blaylock, on this, in your opinion? How serious is it? How serious might it get? Well, the radiation is sort of doing the same thing. It's staying in a tight plume uh, uh, as it uh, drifts across the, the ocean heading towards the United States. And the levels that we're seeing now, interestingly, uh, the uh, eastern United States, uh, some of its locales have higher uh, radiation levels uh, than the West Coast. That comes as a great shock to many people. They don't think that way. They think in a linear fashion, uh, right. you know, west to east, and it just right. doesn't work that way. And it's, it's, again, because it's up into the upper atmosphere it's in a tight plume as it passes over, say, uh, California and gets to, to Philadelphia, uh, and then it rains, then that upper atmosphere radiation concentrates deeper inland. Uh, so you're going to have spots, you're going to have areas in the United States which you're going to have much higher radiation levels. But until we get enough people doing independent uh, radiation testing, and I think that's going to start coming out. It's sort of like what happened in the, in the Gulf uh, BP oil spill. Mm-hmm. Uh, independent biologists began to go in there and look, and they refuted everything the government was saying uh, because the government immediately said, well, the beaches are pristine and the water is clear and the FDA finds no oil in the seafood. Well, that's uh, a little trick of the language there. Well, it leaves me beyond outraged as it does you and, and, and too sure. many people I mean, to count. It's, the yeah. Gulf Coast. That's right. Uh, and the, the oil breakdown product uh, and the dispersant product are not even being measured in the seafood. So they can say, well, we're not finding oil in the seafood because they just do a sniff test. They just smell the food, uh, the, the shrimp and the crab, and if they don't smell oil. Uh, but these products, these ba- breakdown products, are odorless. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to have to wait the same sort of way with this. As uh-huh. The independent people are going to start measuring radiation uh, and giving us some more accurate numbers in terms of uh, what's happening. Uh, I was asked, what do we need to look for? And I said, well, you know, in, in the initial stage of any nuclear reactor uh, event like this or a nuclear bomb, your first uh, episode is going to be particulate matter that's radioactive. So your vegetables are going to be dusted with it on the outside. It's a matter of washing them off in the beginning. Uh, but once it soaks into the soil, mm-hmm. then this radioactive material is taken up to the inside of the plant and you can't remove it. Right, just like herbicides and pesticides and exactly. too many other things to count, right. Exactly. So, uh, And the same thing in animals. You know, the animals are going to eat the grass and the, and the grains, and they're going to take the radiation into the meat, uh, the fish, uh, all this radioactive water being dumped. Uh, you know, 
again, people are saying, well, you know, say 12 million gallons of radioactive water sounds like a lot, but not compared to the ocean. Well, again, you have currents that pass in the ocean, just like the plumes in the atmosphere. Uh, it tends to stay concentrated and follow, follow these streams. So the, the uh, animal life is going to be taking up the radiation. As the radiation and radioactivity leave Japan, they don't diminish, uh, folks, with the exception of radioactive iodine. That's the only one. It's got a very short half-life that will decay in a seven- or eight-day journey over here. That's about the half-life of it. But the rest of it, the cesium and all the others, no, no, many years. And they are just as strong here as when they left there. And it's a tragic commentary on our times, Dr. Blaylock, that we have to consider our government to be essentially our enemy when it comes to protecting our health and welfare. But that is a fact. Well, yeah, I mean, again, if, if you parallel Katrina, uh, here the people were dying of thirst, uh, they were starving, and uh, the response of the government, the local government, was to uh, refuse to let them leave the city at gunpoint. Uh, they would shoot them if they tried to leave the city. Doesn't get any more blatant than that. Uh, so, you know, the, it, it gets pretty scary in these emergencies. And we had things happen in, in the state of Mississippi, which had even more devastating effect of the, of the hurricane in New Orleans. New Orleans got all the attention. Uh, but it rarely ended up on the television, and people didn't know that these things were happening, but it just turned into anarchy. Getting back to the, the radiation material, the important thing that I'm seeing out of this is when the government starts talking about this, they, they talk only of iodine 131, and mainly for the reasons you pointed out. It has an extremely short half-life, about eight days. Exactly. So two weeks or three weeks, uh, most of that's going to be dissipated in very low levels. Your real danger is the long half-life, like uh, cesium-134, cesium-137, strontium-90, plutonium, uh, you know, which have half-lives of 29, 30 years, and plutonium, 24,000 years. Uh, so we're talking about types of radiation that can ruin uh, huge uh, areas uh, for hundreds, if not thousands of years, make it in uninhabitable. Uh, when all of this happened in Chernobyl, and I, I did a rather intense study of Chernobyl uh, many years ago, uh, it was interesting that not only did the Soviet government cover it up, uh, but the governments in the West tried to keep it as quiet as, as they could as well. And when they had helicopters measuring radiation levels and air currents, they measured only iodine 131, and they uh, mm -hmm. We're not keeping records of the of the longer lasting isotope. Uh, later studies clearly showed that uh, millions of uh, square miles of uh, Europe uh, was contaminated with these long lasting radioisotopes. Well, we're seeing the same thing here. They're measuring out in 131. They're ignoring the longer isotopes, but we're picking them up. Uh, in the United States, in water systems, the drinking water, in the milk, and the cheese. Once it enters the milk, you know, then it's in the animal's meat, then it's in the cheese and the butter, and all the things that are made, the dairy products, uh, begin to, to show contamination levels. Now, these levels aren't high enough to produce acute radiation sickness or any acute effect that you, you're going to notice. The real danger is the long-term effects, the chronic uh, radiation effects. Uh, now, one of the things they've geared up to cover themselves uh, in this event is they start putting out the stories about radiation hormesis, uh, trying to imply that, well, you know, actually low-level radiation is good for you. And uh, I've looked at a lot of that literature and, and the people that were writing the articles about it I wrote an article uh, refuting what they said to a large degree. I said, you know, if you have uh, the perfect diet and the perfect genetics, uh, then uh, hormesis is real. But in a country like the United States where most people don't eat good diets, there's a lot of chronic illness. There's a great number of people with DNA repair defects. 
uh, hormesis is not going to protect you, and this chronic low-level radiation is going to produce a significant increase in disease. Now, one of the other things that they used to cover up the Chernobyl uh, incident was they only measured radiation death rate. Uh, they, you know, you always see uh, quoted, well, the death, uh, cancer death rate did not increase dramatically. Uh, the only significant increase was thyroid cancer, mm-hmm. which increased 21-fold. But they always used uh, the term uh, cancer death rate. Well, the vast majority of people weren't dying of the cancer, but they had the cancer induced by the radiation. So for every person that died of cancer, we had thousands of cases of induced cancer that didn't die that ended up in the statistics. Now, uh, what happens in, in Eastern Europe, a lot of these people died of heart failure <clears throat> or other disorders before they died of their cancer. Uh-huh. So they were never listed as a cancer death. Right. Uh, this covers it all up. This sure. makes it look different. Statistical well, slate of hand. That the, sure. The issue with Chernobyl was, in reporting primarily iodine-131, and you mentioned correctly, of course, the Western nations were doing the same thing. They were all basically trying to protect the nuclear industry. Sure, uh, and, and to protect their, their crops and their, their milk industry and their cheese sure. industry. Because, yeah. uh, you know, the first thing that starts uh, getting geared up is, well, we got to protect all of these things because people are going to be frightened and not drink the milk and not eat the cheese, and that's going to have economic impact. Right. So that takes precedence over the health effect. Well, we're already protecting the dairy industry, the beef industry, big agriculture, and now we're protecting the fish industry. And if you go look at the top of headlines, you'll see FDA won't test Alaska fish for radiation. Don't worry. Be happy. Open that page, and I just uh, just hurriedly put it together because it was very important for you to see now. Do pass it along. You'll see the first map. It shows the Oyashio current coming down from the Sea of Okhotsk and the Bering Sea, right next to the east coast of Japan off Fukushima, and the Kuroshio current going up, and they meet, and they both head east directly across the Pacific. If you scroll down the page you'll see the North Pacific Current, which is what they both become when they marry and run off. They head across the ocean together as the North Pacific, and then they split along about, uh, if you go on a straight line, Washington State. Half of it goes north into the Gulf of Alaska, where it swirls and swirls and swirls counterclockwise, and eventually just stays there. The other half heads south and comes right down the west coast. It's called the California Current. So... You tell me, should the feds be checking fish, especially in the weeks and months to come, or not? I think we all agree on the answer. Dr. Blaylock, anything to add to that? Well, you're right, and and their view is if you don't know, uh, then you can say it's safe. Uh, You know, they can say, well, we don't have any evidence that the fish is contaminated or of any danger, and we think it's safe to eat. Uh, but uh, the next question would be, well, did you measure the levels? Well, no. If we measure the levels, we can't make that statement. Uh, we, we see this time and again in every kind of uh, uh, disaster. Uh, it's just like in the Gulf uh, of Mexico. Uh, what they say, we don't smell any oil in the, in the, uh, <laughs> I remember. the seafood. Yeah. You know, that's how the FDA tests it. Well, these things have no odor. So that way they can, uh, without blatantly lie, they, the FDA, in their test, found no problem. Right, the VOCs <laughs> are odorless. Right, right, they don't smell. Uh, and then, again, some of the seafood, in fact, did have oil inside, but they didn't find those samples. Sure, they just scooped those under the table and, right. and look at the ones that, are, that, that uh, don't have the high concentration oil. Well, you know, the other cover-up with uh, this radiation thing is, is every time I look at some of these statistics, it's not just they only count death from cancer, but they ignore all other radiation-related disorders. Uh, and if you know anything about radiation exposure, particularly chronic low-level radiation, uh, the other problems you have is an increased birth defect. Now, when you look in uh, Europe, uh, particularly the western part of Europe, uh, Norway, Sweden, uh, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, uh, you see a dramatic increase in birth defects. 
uh, in children uh, that were born of parents during that period and are being born now. Uh, we see endocrine dysfunction. Uh, even though the iodine 131 increases thyroid cancer, it also increases hypothyroidism uh, and even hyperthyroidism. Uh, pituitary dysfunction is very common uh, without a pituitary tumor being formed. Uh, one of the big surprises to a lot of people is that radiation it can readily cause atherosclerosis, hardening of the artery. Uh, it can lead to uh, heart failure uh, and uh, heart attack, stroke. Uh, this is very well known. So uh, there's a great number of, of disorders, chronic organ failure, kidney mm-hmm. failure, lung wow. failure, wow. that can result from chronic exposure to radiation. It's not even going to enter enter into these these uh, statistics. Uh, they're just going to be written off as well. You, you know, this person just had a uh, stroke. Had right, a heart that's that. It's gross plausible deniability right down the page. Sure. Yeah. Sad. Uh, so those those are the kind of things that concern me. Is that when when I look at these these sites where everybody's claiming safety and that we're just a bunch of alarmists, uh, they don't know uh, the the medical aspects of this. Uh, and they don't know how these statistics are being uh, manipulated and doctored. Uh, the, the easiest thing to manipulate the population study. And that's what all of these things are based on population studies. People move in and out of populations. They know that. Uh-huh. So it's hard to track uh, disease rates. Now, when I looked at reports of doctors who traveled to Eastern Europe uh, and Belarus, uh, their story is quite different. In fact, one of the, the, the reporters said, uh, if you want to see how many are dying in, in uh, these areas from Chernobyl, just visit the graveyard. It's filled with the, uh, the graves of, of babies and young children hmm. uh, that all died or, you know, shortly after this event. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, that's easily ignored by the media and by the, the government. Now, my interest in, in all of this as I got to looking into it is, is, well, how do you protect yourself? Well, it's interesting right now I'm seeing in, in Japan they're telling people, well, well don't eat vegetables. Uh, and uh, the ironic thing is the flavonoids in the vetro- vegetables are the most potent radio protection. So even though the vegetables may accumulate some of the radiation, mm-hmm. they also have the most powerful inhibitors of radiation damage. No one has said that. I've never heard that before. Thank no. you. No. You see, I wrote, uh, I, I tell you about the ebook that I wrote on uh, radiation protection uh, called Nuclear Sunrise, which mm-hmm. uh, is a downloadable ebook. Uh, and in this, I researched all that's known about radio protection uh, by natural uh, substances. Well, NASA does most of the research in radio protection. And what they realized is all the drugs that had been created were so toxic, they couldn't use them. And so they started looking at Mm -hmm. natural substances, flavonoids from plants, Mm -hmm. and garlic, and ginkgo biloba, and things like that. And what they discovered is that there's things in plants, these flavonoids, that are enormously powerful radioprotectant. For instance, uh, ginkgo biloba has been shown to contain components that are that are, uh, protect the DNA, the most sensitive part of it, uh, of this radiation damage. Ginger uh, not only protected the DNA, but it protected animals against massive uh, exposure to gamma radiation, the most damaging of all. Really? What kind uh, of a dose a day are we talking about of ginkgo? Uh, well, we're talking about the, the doses that people take for health effects. Hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, 250, 360 milligrams a day. And that gives significant radio protection. Curcumin, uh, the extract from the spice turmeric, is an enormously powerful radio protector. What about garlic, uh, Dr. Blair? Uh, garlic is a very powerful radio protector. Hmm. Uh, quercetin, elagic acid, uh, pomegranate extract, which is very high in elagic acid. Alpha lipoic acid? Alpha lipoic acid. In fact, that was one of the projects they did in Chernobyl. Uh, they went over there and they measured uh, clastogenic factors, uh, which are protein oxidized products uh, in people who are exposed to radiation. They, these levels rise very high. And so they gave these children and, and young people uh, alpha lipoic acid 
their levels returned to, to normal, even below normal. So it was enormously protective. Uh, so there's a, a great mm-hmm. number of these these uh, products mm-hmm. that are being found to protect the most sensitive tissues in the body and the most sensitive part of the cell, the DNA. You also mentioned resveratrol. I want to make sure we got that out on the table, too. Yeah, resveratrol is a very potent radioprotectant. Hmm. Um, and in a dose, about 200 milligrams twice a day. Uh, Hesperidin uh, was found to be uh, very protective of the DNA in a dose of about 6 grams a day, which is not an unusual dose. And you, you've got very, very powerful protection against radiation damage to your DNA and bone marrow. Well, that's your most sensitive tissue. The most sensitive tissue and radiation exposure is the brain, uh, the GI tract, and the hemopoietic system of the blood-forming organs. And all of these compounds are found to be incredibly protective of these tissues. Uh, you know, it used to be when they started out, they looked at vitamin E and vitamin C. Well, they're, they're way down the scale compared to these compounds. Hmm. Uh, vitamin E is considered just a modest uh, radioprotectant. Uh-huh. Uh, vitamin C is a little bit more powerful protecting, and together they uh, have a synergistic protection. But when you compare them to things like curcumin and quercetin, there's just no comparison. Wow. And this is all in your book? It's all in the book. Tells the dose, how it works. Uh, and, you know, the, the uh, e-booklet is written uh, based on nuclear terrorism. But I talk about uh, Katrina, what, how that was handled hospitalization, uh, what people can do in terms of their food, how to prepare their food, uh, how to protect their food, uh, what foods to choose to give you the greatest protection, uh, how to purify your water. Uh, You know, one of the things that's never mentioned, and and I'm doing a lot of research in this area now, is is uh, nano-scaled neurotoxic metals. Uh, for instance, if you compare the toxicity of aluminum as regular particulate uh, aluminum to nanoscaled aluminum, that is nano-sized particles of aluminum, uh-huh. the nano-size is hundreds of times more toxic uh, wow. in the brain and every organ. goes where it well, wants to go. Yeah. And nano-sized uh, particles from these reactors, uh, the smaller the particle, uh, the more harmful it is the more damaging, the easier it can uh, reach the nucleus of the cell. Another trick that is often used is the uh, feds will say something like, well, you'd have to drink 900 liters of milk a day, uh, and if you did, you'll get the same amount of radiation you'd get on a cross-country airplane flight. See, that that's apples and oranges. Exterior exposure is not the same as ingestion, is it? Well, the, the real false, you know, and they use that with the TSA radiation, and I wrote about that. When you talk about being radiated in an airplane flight, it's, that's the radiation over your entire body. So you, you have to break that down into uh, the radiation exposure per square centimeter of tissue, which then is enormously small. Now, when you consume milk with strontium-90 in it, that strontium-90 accumulates in your bone tissue which is right next to your bone marrow. Uh So it's not evenly distributed in your body. It's concentrated, and it continues to concentrate. Every time you drink milk, more of it accumulates, and it stays there. Right. Uh, And the half-life of strontium-90 is 30 years. So it's going to be there your entire lifetime, radiating in a small area uh, of concentration, which is going to put you at a greater risk, far greater than flying in an airplane. So that's right. a deception. They know it. I mean, everybody that knows anything about radiation and biological tissues knows that. It, it, but they, they know the general public doesn't know that, that difference. 